I want to start off with this little meme that we've created. Uh, Pharaoh, you know, back in Egypt many, many centuries ago, claimed divine sanction for enslaving people. Uh, Pharaoh was claimed to be the son of the god Ray. And therefore, you know, he could do whatever he wanted to do. He could enslave people and, and call it good. So he was essentially using uh, religion to keep people quiet and obedient to an unjust system. And what we have with uh, the, the, gr the growth of the Abrahamic traditions, and again, we're not trying to proselytize anybody, we're just trying to explain, the growth of the Abrahamic traditions really were about a response to use of, the, of, of religion to sort of maintain or support or make unjust systems seem inevitable, right? And so there were two parts, two core teachings of the Abrahamic tradition. The first is to love God more than your tribe or tradition, and second, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So the first one is to sort of love the God beyond our idea of God, who in fact created all humanity. And therefore we, we should not otherize or demonize or hate people just because they come from a different religion or tradition, because they eat uh, a different food or they wear different clothes or speak a different language. So we're to love the God beyond our idea of God who cannot be controlled by anybody. Um, and recognize that that impels us to love our neighbor because we're able to recognize our neighbor as human. And that's sort of the shortest course on the Abrahamic traditions that I can manage, right? So uh, the whole idea of jihad is actually, you know, throughout the Christian faith as well. Um, there's all kinds of terms that are very similar around of, you know, following Jesus or being a faithful member of a tradition it revolves around effort it takes work. When we live inside of a society, you know, that society gets placed in us as well. We're not just living in it. Our, our heart and mind and perceptions get aligned with it. And to the extent that that society is unjust, we have to do internal work to try to figure out, you know, how to see the world differently and how to work for change. Uh, within the Christian tradition, um, we also have a very similar notion of character development, that we have to struggle and work at that um, because we have some vulnerabilities as human beings toward anger or toward demonizing other people, for instance, and we have to work on ourselves. And then there's also a very powerful sense within the Christian tradition and, and Jewish tradition as well in terms of working for justice and peace in society. And, uh, and, they're, they're, and so all of those sort of notions of jihad are very much a part of the Christian faith. So one of the challenges, of course, is that um, just as Pharaoh, you know, used uh, religion in a way to kind of justify an unjust system of slavery, enslavement of other people, well, sometimes the Abrahamic tradition has been used the same way. And so as a Christian, I want to, you know, call out Christians here for a minute. Um, this is uh, it, from 1452, Pope Nicholas V was asked by the king and queen of Spain um, to justify or provide divine sanction for violence against Muslims and Jews and other people. And this is what Pope Nicholas wrote to provide that sanction. Uh, we grant you by these present documents with our apostolic authority, full and free permission to invade, search out, capture and subjugate the Saracens, that is the Muslims, and pagans and any other unbelievers, which probably included Jewish people, right? And enemies of Christ, wherever they may be, as well as their kingdoms, duchies, counties, principalities, and other property, and to reduce their persons to perpetual servitude. So this is divine sanction for a king and queen being able to take over anybody's land anywhere if they're not Christian. I can't imagine Jesus saying okay to that. Okay, I can't imagine that. And yet that's what the leaders of the church did at that point in Spain and throughout Europe. And so we have to recognize that, that every religion can be used. Every philosophy can be used. Every group identity can be used to promote and justify violence once it starts. Now, the important piece is this, that the kings and queens of Europe, for instance, um, often used religion as an excuse or a scapegoat for the violence that they wanted to perpetrate. So they not only used religion to justify their violence, they used it to excuse their violence to say, well, that wasn't really me, that was really them. But in reality, it was in fact um, the kings and queens. So the last century, for instance, 
was probably the least religious century in the history of humanity. But we saw 262 million people murdered in genocide. Much of the time, that was by people who had no faith at all. And so what has happened a bit around uh, understanding Muslims and Islam is that we've taken some negative assumptions about religion in general and placed them all on our Muslim sisters and brothers as well. So there have been a number of studies talking about the role of war, of religion in war. And the BBC did a study and found that only 15% of major conflicts had some kind of religious motivation. Um, Phillips and Axelrod said it was only 7%. Gordon Martell said six. And of those percentages, all of them say that religion played kind of a relatively minor role. That normally it wasn't the G word for God that was the source of it, it was the G word for greed. Greed was the source of that. And the same is true when we talk about uh, political violence. So people who study political violence and where it comes from have found that typically the ideology comes later. There's other rationale and motivations for engaging in some kind of violence. Um, but actually what they try to do is that as they're preparing for violence or after they've done it, they start to try to find ways to justify it. And that's how, that's how it happens so many, many times. And so what we just wanna help us recognize is that we, we often overestimate the role of ideology in violence when really there's economic or other kinds of issues that people have experienced. And so I just wanna share with you that the prophet Muhammad lived approximately 24,000 days. And you know, if, if all of the false information about Muslims and Islam were true, right? How many of those days do you think he would have engaged in some kind of combat? Well, it's only six, right? So if, if violence was at the root of the thing, you'd think he would have been more faithful, right? And done more, but he was faithful and he only did it six days. And of those six days, how many were done aggressively? How many were done in offense? And the answer is zero. So our whole like picture of, of Islam and Muslims has been so shaped in many respects by the same kind of, of, uh, of perspective um, as, as a Pope, Pope Nicholas V shared in 1452 trying to dehumanize an entire group so that the kings and queens of Spain can go ahead and do what they want and take their land and enslave them. And so we've got a lot of work to do in our entire society to stop applying collective blame to each other, to work for, uh, to uphold the freedom and the human rights of every single person and not allow our differences to become sources of violence toward each other and to recognize where the true sources of, of violence are in this, in this country. Right now, we saw on January 6th, a lot of white nationalist groups and groups that claim to be Christian. We saw people carrying crosses right outside there and then went on in and hurt our police officers there. And so we have to recognize that, that all human beings are vulnerable uh, to getting so fearful and so angry that we engage in violence. But we have to recognize that typically uh, thoughts of ideology come much later and are used only to justify. And we got to make sure that we don't allow us ourselves to justify our violence um, on the basis of, of religion or philosophy. So with that, we just want to invite all of you to, um, to respond to any questions. And there's one that Beth asked about Anila, and, and I'll, I'll just try this first, Anila, and then you, you go. She said she noticed that sometimes Anila uses the word God when the on-screen word is Allah. So when I went to... Um, to Israel and Palestine, um, I went to a, a, an Episcopal church that was Arabic speaking. And the word that they use uh, for, for God in the, in the Arabic Bible is Allah. Allah is just the everyday, like, you know, open, so, open sourced word for God in Arabic. And, uh, and that's all it is. And so, um, so sometimes Muslims will say Allah, sometimes they say God. In, in the same way that people who speak multiple languages, you know, get different parts of their language in, um, they use both languages in certain sentences.